fruit. And so what we've been looking at is there's a passage in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that talks about what God should be producing in our life. If his spirit resides in us, how should we behave? How should we act? What kind of virtues should the spirit be harvesting or producing producing in in our character and in our soul? And so far we've talked about love. Love really is saying, what is in the best interest of the people around me? It's not how I feel or our emotional state or whether or not I'm attracted to someone. Biblical love answers the question, what is the best interest for the other person? And it makes that decision. It's an action. We've talked about joy. Joy is not always feeling happy, but it's being able to give thanks for the things that are in your life and for the situation that you're at, regardless of your circumstances. True joy rejoices despite your circumstances. And we talked about how Paul was in prison and he wrote to the letter of Philippians while he was in prison, rejoice, and I say again, rejoice. So love, joy, and then peace. Being reconciled and at harmony with God and with each other. You're no longer in a state of war. We've talked about long suffering. It's the idea of patience. And this carries the idea of being patient, suffering long with difficult people and how we need to love difficult people. Why? Because we are a difficult person. So we talked about long suffering and then kindness. Kindness asks the question, how can I help? What can I do to help you? It's not just a sweet disposition, but it is an attitude of what can I do to help around here? And then finally, we talked about goodness. Goodness, when you say, man, that's such a good person, they're always willing to do the right thing with grace. And so we've worked down through the harvest or the fruit of the Spirit, and today we're going we're gonna to summarize and we're going to end the sermon series with the final three, faithfulness to God, gentleness with each other, and self-control for myself. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, I actually had to exercise these uh, three fruits of the Spirit this morning. I went ahead and took a picture of my daughter and uh, put it online. I was cutting my hair this morning in the bathroom uh, because my, deci- my daughter decided to wake me up at four, like four o'clock this morning. And so I'm really tired. <laughs> Parenting's exhausting. I know I say it up here, but it makes me feel good to complain to you guys, okay? Parenting is exhausting. So here I am with Piper. She wakes me up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm just laying on the couch. And then finally I get up and, um, and then I make my way to the bathroom and I decide I'm going to cut my hair this morning. And she comes in with me because, you know, normal people are still asleep. And so uh, mom's been sick and so she's still in bed. And so I bring Piper into the bathroom with me. And, uh, you know, I kind of let her do her thing. She's got Woody and one of her other favorite characters from Toy Story. And I'm cutting my hair, and Piper's being great. In fact, she's behind me, and I can kind of see her reflection, like, in my peripheral vision. And after, like, I get done cutting my hair, I turn around, and I see my daughter. She has got a hold of a makeup stick of my wife. It's some type of blush. I I don't know, okay? It's basically lips. Everything's lipstick that comes in a tube you rub it on. And so she has smeared it like a clown all over her face, on her forehead, in her hair. She's rubbed it all over the shower walls, on, on, the, on the floor, and I could not help but laugh. And I, and I told myself, God, I just need to be faithful to you right now and not sin. I need to be gentle with my daughter and not harsh, and I need to exercise some self-control for myself. So good morning. That's how my morning started off. Welcome to the 21st century, Rick. Man, parenting is difficult. And, uh, and, but I love my daughter, you know, she's great. She had this big smile and I took a picture and I said, cheese, and she said, cheese. And so I got a really good picture of her. And so if you follow me online, you can look at that and have a laugh, what I got to deal with this morning. So I had to give her a shower and she screamed the entire time. You thought she would be murdered. That's how loud she screamed. But when it comes to these three things, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the first one that, you know, we want to take a look at is faithfulness. Now, one of the things that attracted me to my wife was her faithfulness. She loved God. She refused to miss a church service. She read her Bible. She prayed. Um, She was utterly devoted to relationships. That's one of the great qualities about my wife, Angel, is that she will fight for things that matter to her. She is faithful. She is not unfaithful. And, you know, in our culture, when I think about the word faithfulness, I feel bad for people who aren't married. I feel bad for people who have married someone who hasn't been faithful because that is one of the most Horrible things that you could ever experience is being married to somebody that you commit yourself to, and they're not faithful. They cheat on you. They break the covenant. 
um, that they, they engage with. And that's something really hard to, to work through. And so one of the things that I looked for, a quality that I looked for in a spouse was somebody who was utterly faithful. That's one of the most important things to me in a relationship, not just marriage, but also friendships as well. And if the Spirit of God resides in our heart, and God is an utterly faithful God, what does that say about you and I? What should the Spirit be producing in us? Well, it should be faithfulness. Faithfulness can be described simply as this, the character of one who can be relied on. To be faithful is to be trusted, to be reliable. And I think about this key word when I think about faithfulness. Faithfulness is somebody who is reliable. You know, I don't know about you, but there are some times where I feel like, you know, whether you call the doctor's office or you talk to somebody on the insurance company or you take your vehicle to get it fixed, do you ever feel like you just can't trust people because they're not reliable? I mean, you've got to really look out for yourself now. Somebody says they'll do something and you find out, well, it hasn't been done. They were supposed to send a payment through. They were supposed to give you a reimbursement. They were supposed to fix something. And our culture is filled with a lot of people who I don't think are really reliable, But as Christians, one of the things that we should have as a fruit of the Spirit is we can be depended on because that's who God is. And so when it comes to our marriages, when it comes to our work ethic, when it comes to whether or not our yes is yes or our no is no, we need to be the kind of people who do what we say we're going to do. Now, I think I'd be the first one to admit that we all fall short and we all stumble and we all make mistakes. And finding reliable people, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, finding somebody who you can depend on. And, you know, I think about people who can watch my kids. That's a very small group, in my opinion. Because I just really don't know everyone as well as I would like to. There aren't a lot of people who I can necessarily depend on to care for my kids the same way that I or Angel would. You know, Proverbs makes it loud and clear. I mean, this guy had been through it all. He had everything you could ever attain. He was the wealthiest, wisest man to ever live. And here's what he had to say. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, he says... Many a man proclaims his loving devotion, but who can find a trustworthy man? Who can find a dependable person? Somebody who will follow through and do what they say they're going to do. So he understood it. The psalmist cried out this in Psalms chapter 12, Help, O Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished among men. They lie to one another. They speak with flattering lips and a double heart. Dependable people are are hard to find. But as I said, God himself is dependable. You know, Romans chapter 3 says this. Paul puts it like this. Even if we are not faithful, God is. That's who we serve. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. When God says he's going he's to forgive you, he's going to do it. When God says he loves you, he's going to do it. When God says that he will give you a reward if you obey the gospel which is eternal salvation, he will do it. And I think one of the reasons why we struggle trusting God is because we all deal with each other and we all make mistakes and we struggle to be relied upon and we struggle um, to trust other people. But when it comes to God, he is utterly reliable and faithful. And if God gives us his Holy Spirit, that's what he should be producing in us. You know, when it comes to the life of the Christian, we are promised tribulation. We are promised challenges. The book of Revelation was written to seven churches, but there were more than seven churches to the areas that it was written in. And I take a um, a view that the book of Revelation is highly metaphorical and allegorical, that we should not take it literally, but literarily. Um, But in this first passage, these first couple chapters, Paul, or not Paul, but John writes to seven different churches that really represent the church at large. And there was one specific church that was really struggling with temptation and trials, And here's what John had to say in John chapter 2. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. And you will suffer tribulation for 10 days. But be faithful even unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. When I think about faithfulness, I think about husbands and wives, families, churches. But most importantly, I think about my relationship with God. There are Christians all over the world who are tested even to the point of death. And God says, if you are faithful, I'll give you the crown of life. And there, be mo- there may be moments when you're at your job or in your family or amongst your friends or even if you're serving on the mission field where your life will be confronted with these sacred truths that we hold dear. And the Bible calls us to be faithful. Not perfect, but every time you get knocked down, you get back up. 
Faithfulness is an important quality. You know, and here's my encouragement to you if you struggle with faithfulness. Start small. Keep the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Don't forsake it. Hear a sermon. Come to church every Sunday. Don't forsake it. Read your Bible. Start out one day a week. Don't forsake it. Start out praying one day a week. Don't forsake it. Serve one time a month. Don't forsake it. I mean, if you are struggling with faithfulness, if you are not being busy choosing spiritual things, start small and work from there. And when you start small and you're consistent with that, God can build off of your faithfulness. And so that's my encouragement to you. Jesus put it like this. If you are faithful with little, you will be faithful with much. And so when God gives you your children, your family, your free time, and you are faithful to him with that, God will bless you with more of it. We need to be faithful with our talents. We need to be faithful with our relationships. And then the second thing that Paul talks about in Galatians 5 is gentleness. You know, gentleness is often really misunderstood in our culture because we think somebody who is gentle is what? Weak. Oh, you're just such a gentle person. You're timid. You're shy. You don't really, you know, want to hurt anybody's feelings and show you're this, this person that we often use the word, the biblical word, is you're meek. Oh, that person is so meek. They are so restrained. Well, that's not what gentleness means. That's not what meekness means. To be gentle means that you're not domineering. You're not imposing your will on other people. It meant this, power under control. The word that's often pictured in classical Greek literature is a powerful horse. You've got this horse that really could do a lot of damage to you. But somebody trains the horse. Somebody puts the horse into its proper place. It's got all of this power. It can run. It can jump. It can cause a lot of injury. But all of this power is under control. Aristotle used this word gentleness to talk about elephants. I love elephants. They are literally like the coolest animal ever. Um, but they can, they can inflict a lot of pain. But when you see an elephant with all of that power and it's brought under control, that's what it means to be meek and gentle. I think a, a good reference for 21st century for us today would be a guard dog. I mean, you get something like a, a pit bull or a shepherd, something that is strong, and if its jaws are locked on you, it's not letting go, right? Unless what? You give it the command. All of this power, all of this strength, but yet it's under control. Aristotle had this to say in his book on virtues. He said, gentleness is the ability to bear reproaches and slights with moderation and not to embark on revenge quickly and not to be easily provoked to anger, but to be free from bitterness and contentiousness, having tranquility and the stability of your spirit. It literally means this, to master the power of your personality. Words are really powerful. Our actions and our personalities are really powerful. But if I am gentle, if I am meek, I will bring those powerful aspects about who I am under control and the influence of God. That's what it means to be gentle. It's facing truth without resentment. It's the ability to be angry without sinning. It's the ability to argue without being intolerant. It is the ability to rebuke without being vindictive. It is this strength of who we are, but it's brought under control. You know, when I think about the, the Greek culture, Aristotle had some things to say about it. Plato had some things to say about it. Plato actually put it like this. It's a strong beast which could be tamed and fed by a man who learned how to handle it. And so when you think about being gentle, right, when you think about being meek, it's taking the most powerful qualities of who you are and it's bringing it under control. Some of us have mental strength. We have the ability to argue and reason and prove points, and that can be abused. Some of us have physical strength. We have the ability to impose our will on other people. That's one of the things they taught us in football, right? Is you impose your will on the other person and you beat them into submission. Well, we shouldn't do that with our physical strength of the people around us. Some of us have skills and abilities, and we have talents and we have power. But when we bring these things under the control of God, he can do great things with us. When you are gentle, you surrender your power for the greater interest of yourself and the people around you. Jesus put it like this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here is God in the flesh saying, come unto me. I'm gentle. My power is under control. 
You know, my grandfather used to say this, man, if I was God, I'd be zapping people. Like, you know what I mean? Like with lightning from heaven. Man, you get on my nerves, zap. But that's not God, man. He does not abuse his power. It doesn't come out of control. When you're in a relationship with God, he's not going to abuse you. Maybe you've been abused and hurt. Maybe people haven't been faithful to you. Maybe people have been vindictive to you. And maybe even people who bear the name of Christ have hurt you in ways that have given you such a bitter taste for the church. That's not a reflection of who God is. God's power is under control. He is never going to domineer and impose his will on you. He wants a relationship with you that is mutual by your free choice. And so what do we do as a Christian? Well, I'd like to give you some examples of ways that we can be gentle with each other. And I'm going to give you biblical examples. Here's number one. James put it like this in James chapter 1. Get rid of all moral filth and every expression of evil and humbly, in gentleness, receive the word planted to you, which can save your souls. You know, one of the things that I've confronted in the church is what I call spiritual bullying. It's people who want to receive the word for their own gain, but then they want to manipulate it and twist it to hurt other people around them. If somebody hurts you, you bully them spiritually. You pull out your favorite Bible verse, you bash them over the head with it, and whenever it suits you, you use that verse without taking your own humility into perspective. That's something that we need to run away from. We cannot get in the habit of twisting and using God's word to suit our own selfish gain. And that's one of the reasons why I love our movement, why I love our church, is because we simply want to do what the Bible teaches We simply want to preach what the Bible preaches. We don't want to twist it or manipulate it or use it for our own selfish purposes. We want to honor it in all ways. If the Bible says to do something, we should do it. But over the centuries and over the years, and I think that we've all been familiar with this, all you got to do is turn on the TV and you can see some evangelist preacher who gets on his soapbox and uses the word of God to manipulate people into what? Giving them money. But there are other people who use the word to manipulate getting sex getting sex from children, getting sex from people who are divorced and widows. I mean, it is a very evil thing to intimidate and spiritually manipulate people with the word of God. And so as a Christian, if we are going to be gentle, we need to take this word, which is very powerful, which can transform and change people, and we need to honor God with it, to not use and abuse it in such a way for our own selfish purposes. So that's number one. Humbly receive the word and don't use it for your own selfish gain. Number two, how about this? We've got to approach brethren who are in error, who have sinned with a spirit of gentleness. Paul told the church of Galatia in Galatians chapter 6, Brothers, if someone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him with what? The spirit of gentleness. But watch yourself. Or you may also be tempted. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. (laughs) To be gentle is to walk up along along someone who has sinned and have the goal of restoring them back to their relationship with Jesus. You're not using that as an opportunity to say, I told you so. Oh, you remember a few months ago when you said this about me and you were hypocritical and you just used that as an opportunity to beat them down and discourage and destroy their soul? That is not what it means to be gentle. You have the power. If you catch somebody in sin, could you beat them up and make them feel like a terrible person? Well, sure you could. You've got the advantage because you're not the one who's caught with your hand in the cookie jar. But the Bible tells us to restore them in the spirit of gentleness. Handle them gently, in other words, because their soul is at stake. So if there is someone who is caught in sin, encourage them. Love them just as God has encouraged and loved you. Because how we handle people in their sin is how God will handle us. And so we got to be careful. Number three, we've got to correct people who oppose what is true in the spirit of gentleness. You know, Timothy, he was a young minister, probably under the age of 30, um, Paul, Paul told Timothy, hey, look, Timothy, don't be discouraged because of your age. In the Jewish culture, you weren't allowed to speak in synagogue until you were 30 years old. That's why we think that Timothy was under the age of 30. But Timothy was placed in this situation, this predicament, where he had to actually instruct people who were older than him. 
He had to tell people who were mature and elders by all sense of the word. He had to tell them certain things and correct them. And so this is what Paul told Timothy. And this is something that I think we can all apply to ourselves. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, Paul told Timothy this, A servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, forbearing. He must gently reprove, rebuke, those who oppose him, and the hope that God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. It's not using your intellectual ability to damage the souls and the lives of the people around you. Yeah, I'm sure you know more than the average person. Yeah, I'm sure you've been sitting in church for a long time, and you could really probably manipulate the word of God in such a way to embarrass the person. But is that really the goal? Is the goal to make yourself right and them wrong? Well, what's the goal here? The goal is for them to have a relationship with Jesus. And so we have to change how we view people and we have to change how we approach people when it comes to correcting them or teaching them the word of God. Here's what a person who is not gentle will do. They will take the teaching of God's word and they will use it for their selfish gain that they are right and you are wrong. That's the goal. And so we've got to be careful to not be gentle when it comes to teaching the word of God. Here's another one. People are going to ask you about why you believe what you believe. And we can become so defensive and so sensitive that when people who maybe are atheists or agnostic question our belief, or maybe they belong to a different religion, we can get to the point where we insult them and we shout at them, and we're not very gentle about it. Peter had, had this to say, But in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have, but respond with gentleness and respect. Oh yeah? Well, you're an idiot for believing that. Well, that is so stupid. Who could possibly believe such a dumb thing? Well, you're a sinner anyways. These are all things that we do, and I've been guilty of it to where we impose harshness and mean-spiritedness and intellectual superiority over people, and it hurts them. There have been times where I've joked, you know, from the stage, from the pulpit, when I'm preaching or teaching, and it hurts people because there are people in this room who don't believe everything I believe, whether it's about the doctrine of salvation or end times belief. And sometimes I'll be sarcastic, you know, trying to be witty, but I'll be sarcastic, and it's actually mean-spiritedness, and it's hurtful. And people have shared that with me, and I've taken the opportunity to apologize because I don't want people leaving here feeling discouraged and hurt. The goal is to teach them the truth in such a way that they're convinced and persuaded by it, not discouraged and hurt. Look, the truth is hard enough to accept. We don't need our attitude and our personality getting in the way. Let the cross be the stumbling block, not who we are as a person. And so these are ways that we can be gentle with people around us And you know, meekness is absolutely essential for the Christian life. Paul Paul says it, James says it, if you want to be wise and you want to live skillfully, be meek. Put your power under the control of God. And if you are a Christian and the Spirit of God lives in your heart, meekness will be something that will be harvesting in your soul and in your spirit. And then thirdly and finally, probably my most favorite because it's my weakness, self-control. I'm addicted to sugar. It is no question. And we do. We laugh at it. But legitimately, I like, if, when I buy my wife candy bars, I was sharing this with someone this morning, when I buy my wife candy bars, I tell her, hide it. Because there will come a moment where I have a craving. I mean, it's like I'm a drug addict. I literally looked for a candy bar last week for 15 minutes, and I could not find my wife's hiding spot. <laughs> Isn't that pathetic? But it's true. A total, complete lack of self-control. I want you to picture in your mind for a moment a world with no self-control, where people just gave in to every passion that they felt, and they never told themselves, no or wait, not yet. We would be living in chaos. And that's, we are in a culture war. I don't know if you've recognized it or not, but we are in a culture war that is getting rid, really, of self-control. If you feel it, and it feels good, do it. And so this is something that the Spirit of God should be producing in our life. I mean, when I think about a a world without self-control, obviously I think about war. If you don't have self-control when it comes to the possessions of other people, you'll, you'll cause war. And that's exactly what we see. Whether we want oil, precious metals, strategic places throughout the Middle East or in America or wherever, we even see it in our own political voting system. I mean, if you desire so intensely power, control, sex, and money, we will have war. 
I think about crimes. I mean, I was, uh, I was reading, I, I like a little, like, okay, like, don't judge me, okay? But when Bitcoin was big a couple years ago, I started doing some research on it and um, read a little bit more about it. And there's a lot of different cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. But I was so discouraged because this is just the world as it is. There was one, uh, a couple posts that I read about. This guy wanted to invest in what's called Ethereum. It's just, it's a, it's a cryptocurrency, but it's not like Bitcoin. Long story short, he bought in when it was $7, and it had this massive run. It's like buying a stock, okay? It's like investing in Google or Apple when it was just a few dollars. And so he bought in when it was 7 he sold it when it was 14 and then it just kept going up. And he said, I'm going to wait till it dips back down, right? For those of you who are financial savvy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to wait for the correction to happen, and I'll buy back in. But you know what happened? Never corrected. Never got a chance to buy back in. And he even said this. He says, I've even thought about committing suicide because I missed the opportunity to invest. Think about that. He even thought about this. This is what he even said. I've even thought about scamming people out of their money to get back what I would have gotten in my investment. A total and utter lack of self-control. Now, I don't struggle for lust of money I don't struggle for lust of power. I don't struggle for lust of sex. I don't struggle for lust of alcohol. I won't tell you what I do struggle with, food being one of them, obviously. I've shared that with you. But there are some things that I don't have to exercise self-control of, but that doesn't mean I have the spirit of self-control. Just because I'm not a drug addict or I don't struggle with sexual addiction doesn't mean I'm a person who is in self-control. And so this is entirely subjective for the people around us. I don't know what your challenge is, whether it's money, Instagram likes, sex, social media popularity, power at work. I don't know what it is, but let the word of God speak to you and produce the spirit of, uh, the spirit of self-control. Here's the basic idea. It's to have power over an object. It is the chief virtue for our personal selves. Another word for self-control was temperance. It literally means to hold the desire in. We all have desires, don't we? I think we all want influence, money, sex, delicious tasting food. Everybody has those desires and wants those things. Self-control is when you don't let those desires go beyond their intended bounds. You with me? And so when it comes to self-control, Plato had this to say. He said, self-control is an ordering or a controlling of certain pleasures and desires. It is a man being his own master. How many of us make decisions through our life, with our families, because of the external influence of things that we have no self-control over. Maybe it's food, money, sex, whatever it is. How many of us make decisions based on these things that have mastered us rather than we master them? Aristotle described this word self-control as a man who is ready to abide by the result of his calculation. And so this is the important thing about self-control. You've calculated beforehand. I think food is probably the easiest illustration. It's the one that I thought of. You know, when I think in terms of like theology, food comes to mind, okay? Because <laughs> that's, that's what I wrestle with. But I love food. It's delicious. I mean, it's like my second favorite thing in the world other than my family and God. And so food is awesome. I spend so much money on food. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I've got to exercise some self-control there. But think about whatever it is that you struggle with, okay? It's like calculating your calories for the day. It's meal prepping in advance, it's determining what you're going to use your money on. I have a family member very close to me. She is a shopaholic. She cannot help but spend money and give it away. That's, that's like something that she's addicted to. It creates this high in her mind. Maybe you struggle with sexual temptation. And you know when you're alone and nobody else is there and the computer or the phone's available, you're going to fall. And so put a calculation in. When I'm alone and nobody else is around, I'm going to do something different to exercise self-control when it comes to pornography. When you're around your favorite person who can't help but gossip, calculate what you're going to do beforehand when you're around them and they start to gossip. How are you going to respond? What are you going to do? What is the calculation that you've put in to perspective before you get into the situation? That's how important self-control is. It's all about yourself. Proverbs puts it like this. Like a city that is broken into without walls is a man who has no self-control over his own spirit. Think about the imagery there. 
like a city that's been broken into and has no walls. You have no defense system. You give in. Anytime somebody wants to come in with that thing you don't have self-control on, they march right in and you're taken over. Self-control is to really master yourself. I think about self-control like a loose thread on a t-shirt. What all happens? We all get holes in our shirts. Threads happen. What happens when you start to pull it? Everything else starts coming unraveled. And before you know it, you've got a shirt that's useless because it's got a thread that's never been cut off. And when we don't exercise self-control in one area, you'll notice it spreads to another. People who usually struggle, something like sex addiction, may eventually get into drug abuse or alcoholism. People who struggle with alcoholism may not be able to exercise self-control when it comes to relationships. When you are induced as a drunk, your body and your mind are opened up to things that you would never do. It slowly but surely breaks down the walls of your holiness when you don't exercise self-control. That's how important self-control is. Abraham Lincoln said it like this, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And so the whole point of self-control is to calculate what's going to happen beforehand so that when the time comes, when you're looking for that candy bar for 15 minutes, you're able to put yourself into perspective under subjection of the Holy Spirit, and you're able to go for what you want most, being a healthy person, not what you want now, temporary satisfaction. And you know, I'll conclude with this story. Famous basketball coach John Wooden, he said this, if you discipline yourself, Others won't have to. And that is a New Testament teaching. You know, God doesn't punish us as Christians. He is not up in heaven ready to crack the whip because you made a mistake and because you sinned. But God will discipline us. And he disciplines each person in a different way with the point of restoring them. But this is a solid biblical teaching. If you discipline yourself, God won't have to. That's how important self-control is. And here's the idea When we act in self-control, we take responsibility for our own lives so that we can win. I want to win this race called life. I hope you do too. And self-control will help you accomplish that. Aristotle had it absolutely right. Through discipline, through self-control comes freedom because nothing is your master. You know, I don't consider myself a very fearful person not really afraid uh, of anyone. I'm fearful of God. I'm fearful of people, uh, what somebody might do to my children. But my, myself, I, I've, always, I've always kind of been a fearless person, except for heights, of course. I know, I am so afraid of heights. Like, this kind of, like, scares me a little bit. You know, it's not that bad. I went to, I went to the Columbia, or to the mall uh, in Hanover, and they have that huge rock climbing wall in the sports goods store. My legs start shaking when I'm, like, 10 feet up. All right, it's really, really bad. But I don't, I'm not really afraid of, of people. People don't scare me. I'm not really intimidated. And it's probably to a fault because there are a lot of people out there who could probably do some damage intellectually, physically, okay? Not just like, I'm super strong and all, 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 all. Anyways, when it comes to, I know, it's so random and stupid. But I want to win. And I'm really not afraid of what people might do to me. And so if somebody threatens me for preaching the gospel, that's not going to prevent me from preaching the gospel. What is man going to do to me? I fear God. I don't fear man. I'm really not influenced by money. There's really not a lot of money that you could give me to persuade me to do something that would violate my family, my morals, or my values. It's just, it's not something that I wrestle with or struggle with. Sexual temptation, I have a beautiful wife. We have a wonderful family. Angel and I have a solid relationship. And so, thanks be to God, I'm not tempted with these things. But there are things that I am tempted with. And there are times when I don't have self-control. And there are things that I get disappointed in myself. But every time I get knocked down, I want to get back up. I want to be faithful. I want to be gentle. I want to have self-control. Because I want to win this race called Christianity. Paul put it like this. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we and imperishable. And so the most powerful illustration that he gives is somebody training for the Olympics. They will sacrifice food. They will sacrifice money. They will sacrifice sleep. They will beat their bodies into submission and have complete self-control because they're running for a crown that will perish. Now, what should that say about us who are running for a crown 
that won't perish. What 